so this is what we obtained in the last video. We found a recursion formula that relates the coefficients with each other. And then using this recursion formula, we will be able to start with some number c0. And then we can substitute it inside this recursion formula. And then it will give us c1. And then we can take c1 and then it will give us c2. And this process just keeps on repeating to infinity. And then you can take all these coefficients and then substitute it inside this uh, expression over here. And then your v of y will be a solution to the differential equation. So it seems like we're done, but then we're actually not, because if we allow this sequence of coefficients to keep on generating uh, newer terms all the way to infinity, the resulting v of y that you're going to get is not going to be normalizable. And then this is going to be a problem, because is if the coefficients keep on going, this function is going to behave in an exponential way, which is not normalizable. That means your wave function is not going to be normalizable. And then we know that our wave function must be normalizable. So that means as we keep on generating these terms uh, over here with this recursion formula, we must reach a certain point, let's call it cj max, where the next number that you're going to get is equal to zero. So this will make sure that your string of coefficients do not generate all the way to infinity. And then when it reaches zero, you will just substitute it back into this recursion formula and you can see that you will get 0 multiplied by something, so the output will also be 0. So all the subsequent terms will then be equal to 0. So this is the kind of behavior that we want. So if we get something like this, if our chain of coefficients eventually stop at a certain point, then we can take these coefficients and then substitute it inside this expression, and then the v of y that we're going to get will be a normalizable solution that satisfies the differential equation. So this is the kind of behavior that we want. So j max could be any number that you want. You can choose whatever j max that you want. So let's say I choose j max is equal to 2. That means uh, our coefficients are going to uh, start from 0, and then it's going to reach 1. It's going to reach c2. And then c3 is going to be equal to 0, because our j max is equal to 2. And so that means c3, c4, c5, and so on. All the subsequent terms will be equal to 0. And so uh, since this is the kind of behavior that we want, this tells us something about the recursion formula. The only way for this kind of behavior to uh, to actually happen is that once we reach j max, once we reach j max, when we substitute this number inside this recursion formula to get the next number, what we want is going to be equal to zero. So that means we're going to get c j max multiplied by some numerator, and then we're going to get zero. So this implies that the numerator over here must be equal to zero. And then when we reach j max, the numerator is going to be equal to 2 times j max plus l plus 1 minus y naught. And then in order for this string of coefficients to stop, this must be equal to 0. And if you observe this term, you can see that j max is just an index, so it has to be an integer. l, it, remember that this came from the spherical harmonics, this is also an integer, and then 1 is obviously an integer. So this entire thing here is actually an integer. So you have an integer multiplied by 2. So this whole thing is an even number. So in order for this whole thing here to be equal to 0, our y naught itself must also be equal to an even integer. And then we can character, uh, characterize this by saying y naught is equal to 2n, where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So n could take on any one of these choices. And for each one of these choices, you will get a different string of coefficients. So if n is a, so for uh, different values of n, so let's say n is a larger number, then these coefficients will generate onto higher terms before it stops. If n is a smaller number, then it will generate fewer terms and then it will stop. But then for whatever choice, you're going to get a different string of coefficients. So you're going, that means you're going to get a different solution of v of y. But then it doesn't matter if we get different solutions. All those solutions are all valid and they will be normalizable and they will satisfy the Schrodinger equation. And so this is what this is a very important result that we have just obtained. We know that y naught must be equal to some even, uh, even integer. And then we can choose what this n will be. And for every single different choice, we will get a different value of y naught. And this would correspond to a different vy for every single choice that we make. And so uh, one thing I should, uh, maybe I should ex uh, illustrate this with an example. So let's say if we choose uh, y naught to be equal to 4. This would correspond to the case when n is equal to 2. And let's say we're dealing with a case where L is equal to zero. Once again, remember that this came from the spherical harmonics. So if you if you have a situation like this, then you're going to start generating your coefficients. You start from some number zero, 
and you get C1. And then once you get a reach C1, you want to get C2. So what exactly is C2? So if you check the recursion formula, you'll see that C2 is equal to C1 multiplied by this term. And then the, this numerator over here is going to be equal to 2 times uh, j plus l plus 1. In our case, j is equal to 1, and then l is equal to 0, and then you have plus 1. And then you have minus y0. In this case, y0 is equal to 4. So you see you can, this is equal to 2 times 2, so it's just 4 minus 4, so it's equal to 0. So that means c2 is going to be equal to 0, and that will mean that we have stopped this infinite chain of coefficients. So c2 is equal to 0, this means c3, c4, and so on, all the other terms will be equal to 0. And then now you can take, so only c0 and c1 are non-zero, and then you can take these coefficients and then dump them inside this term here, and then you will get a v of y that is going to be normalizable. So this is the whole process of uh, generating uh, generating solutions with this added restriction of y not being an even integer. So this is how this whole process works. Uh, by restricting y not to be even integer, then you will get something like this. Your uh, your chain of coefficients will eventually stop at a certain point. And uh, I should also mention that you can see that this added restriction actually also imposes restrictions on the values that L could, could take on. So you can see that L cannot be too big. So if L is too big, then this uh, chain of coefficients will not stop. So this will never be evaluated to zero. So, and then it's, e uh, it's easy to see why. So you can, you can see that if, so we can actually choose when, uh, what our J max is going to be. We, want, we can choose when this chain of coefficients is going to stop. So let's say for a given val uh, given choice of j max, and then for a given choice of n, at a certain point you're going to get something like this. So you get two times j max plus l plus one minus y naught, and in this case y naught is going to be equal to two n for your corresponding choice of n, and this is going to be equal to zero. And so you can see that j max plus l plus one must be equal to n, and so you can see that l is equal to n minus one minus j max. So L is going to be equal to this expression over here. So for every different choice of j max, so for every different choice of where you want to end your chain of coefficients, you're going to get a different value of L. And the smallest value of j max is going to be equal to zero. So you can actually have your chain of coefficients to stop at the very point when it starts. So you get C0 and then it will immediately stop. Immediately C1 is going to be equal to 0, and the rest of the terms will be equal to 0. So that will means V of Y is just going to be equal to 1 constant. So it is possible for your J max to be equal to 0. And then for that case, you will get your largest possible value of L. So when J max is equal to 0, you can see that L is equal to N minus 1. And you can see that for other values of J max uh, that is not 0, so let's say it's 1, 2, or 3, your L's that you're going to get are all going to be smaller than N minus 1. So you can see that this actually imposes a restriction on L. So recall that L actually came from the spherical harmonics. So back then when we were solving for the spherical harmonics, L didn't have any restrictions. It could be equal to anything at all. But now you can see that the, normalizer, uh, uh, the normalization actually imposes this extra, uh, uh, extra restriction on the values of L. So you can see that L can only go all the way up to n minus 1. So all larger values are not allowed. And uh, don't forget that, that uh, this is just a reminder uh, in the spherical harmonics, we also had another quantum number, m, and m could take on values equal to 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2, all the way to plus minus uh, l. So you can see that there are two l plus 1 choices here, and there are n choices for l. So this is just something you should take note of. Now we have uh, this restriction here actually imposes a upper bound on the possible values of l. So now let's get back to this. So this boxed expression here is actually super important because this can now give us the allowed energy levels of the electron in the hydrogen atom. So we have shown that our expression y naught is must be equal to 2n. So it must be equal to 2n for our solution to be normalizable. And then n could be equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. It could take on any one of these values. And then recall what exactly is y naught. So y naught is a symbol that we defined. It's a shorthand for m e squared divided by two pi epsilon h bar squared k. So this is y naught is just a shorthand for all this. Remember, we 
introduced this simplification in the first video, so this is just to save myself some time from having to write out all these symbols. And now we know that this, or the, these symbols over here must be equal to 2n. And then don't forget that this k over here is actually related to the energy levels. k is equal to this expression. So now let's try to square both sides, and this would allow us to find what the allowed energy levels are. So by squaring both sides, we have m squared e to the power 4, 4 pi squared, epsilon squared, h bar to the power 4, and then we have k squared, which is negative 2m e divided by h bar squared, and this will be equal to 4n squared. And so now I'm going to dump the e over to the other side, and I'm going to dump the n squared over to the bottom. And also you can see that some of these terms, they cancel out. So this 4, I'm going to bring it to the bottom, so we get 16, and then combine it with the 2, we get 32. We have h bar square here, so this becomes a square. So you can see that e eventually, so don't forget there's also a negative sign, so I'll put the negative sign here. So you can see that the allowed energy levels, e is going to be equal to negative m e to the power of 4, 32 pi square, epsilon square, h bar square, divided by 1 over n square. And I'm going to put a subscript n over here to reflect the n. And then this result here is actually very important. So this gives us the allowed energy levels of the electron. So for whatever choice of n, your so let's say n is equal to 3, then your allowed energy level is going to be, equal, is going to be given by this formula. And this formula here is actually super important. And if you're interested, uh, this, these constants over here is actually equal to 13.6 electron volts. And the reason why this uh, expression here is so important is because when Schrodinger uh, wrote, down his, Schrodinger, uh, wrote down his equation, he didn't know whether he was correct or not. So he just applied the case of the electron in a hydrogen atom, and then he arrived at this, these, uh, this energy level formula over here. And this energy level formula has been known to scientists before the Schrodinger equation. Niels Bohr actually managed to obtain this formula using his uh, rather primitive model of a of an atom. So he was able to arrive at this expression as well, and then he knew that he was onto something because this formula over here is also related to another formula called the Rydberg formula, which was derived empirically. So people, scientists knew that formula was correct uh, empirically, and Niels Bohr was able to explain it using his, uh, using his model of an atom. And then Schrodinger, using his equation, was able to produce the same energy levels as Niels Bohr did. So that means uh, Schrodinger was definitely onto something. He was using his formula, he was able to derive something that was correct. And that is why this result here is so important. So it kind of gives credibility to the Schrodinger equation. He was, Schrodinger was able to reproduce the correct energy levels of the uh, electron in a hydrogen atom.